All right, so thanks everyone for being here today for the AFMS seminar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ivan Vermajo Verma uh, Moreno. Uh, so Ivan received his PhD in aeronautics from the California Institute of Technology um, in 2018, oh, sorry, in 2008. Um, he spent time as a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Turbulence Research at Stanford University. And since 2015, he's been at the Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Southern California. So Ivan's research uh, focuses on turbulent flows involving multi-physics phenomena. And today he will be talking about um, shock-induced phenomena in turbulent flows. And so take it away, please. So thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and thank you also for uh, inviting me to this seminar series. Thank you all for joining. It's a great pleasure to be in these uh, seminars, virtually at least. And I hope that all of you are doing well and staying safe. So what I wanted to tell you about today is uh, some of the progress that we've been making in my research group over the last few years on this uh, shock-induced phenomena. And we do that through numerical simulations and numerical diagnostic tools that we develop. So let's see if I can move to the next slide. I think there is some delay between when I click and when the screen shows up. So hopefully it's not too much. So the, the, the um, outline of the presentation, I had uh, three main topics actually I included here. Shock induced ignition, but I'm not probably going to have time to talk about it. But uh, this work I want to mention in the beginning that is done by the three students that you're going to see on the screen in a moment. He already finished his PhD, so he's graduated from my group. He was working on the statistical analysis of shock induced mixing and also on the problem of uh, shock induced ignition that probably I'll have to, to skip in this talk. And then uh, Jonas Buchmeier is working on the structural tracking, so he's developing numerical diagnostics uh, methodologies to track the geometry and the evolution of structures. And we are applying that to mixing, at least in this presentation, that's what I'm going to tell you about. But he's been working also with uh, some uh, collaborators on multi-phase flows. And then Jonathan Hoy, he is the third student who I'm going to present work today. And he's been working on a related topic, which is that of uh, shock turbulent boundary layer interactions, considering now the coupling between flow physics and structural uh, dynamics then finalize with some conclusions. I want to start motivating this work. What you're going to see in the next slide is um, the, the flow inside the scramjet engine. So this is something that uh, you in Australia are very familiar with because there is uh, strong efforts together with the US and other nations in developing scramjet technology. And this simulation in particular that you see a snapshot of is uh, for the high fire to a scramjet engine. This was flown in um, 2012, I believe. And during my postdoc, I was running simulations of this, of this flow. And I want to highlight two points here. So to your attention, two, two points. The first one is on the shock turbulence interaction on mixing. So what you see here in the highlighted region is the, the fuel that is being injected in blue. Uh, this is the coal. Uh, and then there is a recirculation region that is happening um, here. So the flow is bringing fuel upstream. There is also a shock wave that is generated upstream of this um, fuel injection. And that's going to produce this separation and recirculation, bringing the fuel to mix with the air that is coming from the left. And therefore that's going to produce ignition in this particular configuration of the scramjet operation. So, that's the first justification or motivation for the work that we're going to introduce today on uh, shock-induced mixing. The second one has to do with the flow structural coupling. So that's something that has been a little bit less emphasized in the study of scramjets, at least to my knowledge, but it's also very re relevant. If you think about the separation bubble that is generated in this um, internal flows, that separation bubble has associated low frequency dynamics and those low frequency motions eventually can interact with the, the uh, structure of the engine. 
And therefore, we wanted to look at this uh, FSI, the flow structure interactions that are produced when you have uh, shock waves and turbulent boundary layers interacting together with these flexible panels. So that is something that um, has been studied in the rigid case, the unsteadiness of the shock system and the separated flow, but a bit less so in the flexible panel regime. So these interactions are not only happening in uh, internal engines, but or internal flows coming from the scrum engine. So here's so for example, here is a, a view of one of the experiments by DLR. This is the ShepX experiment that you're about to see. And what you can see is that the aerodynamic fins that are controlling this uh, vehicle during the re-entry, this is hypersonic re-entry, are going to be largely deformed because of the the coupling between the shock waves and the structure together with the heating that is happening in this hypersonic region. So that's the motivation for this work. And uh, I'm going to switch now to the, to the study of shock induced mixing. So we're going to look at it in a canonical configuration. And this is again, the work by uh, Xian Yu Gao. So, the canonical configuration of shock turbulence interaction consists of the following ingredients. We have on the one hand isotropic turbulence, so this was represented here on the left, and then the turbulence is going through a nominally planar shock wave. There is a number of parameters, physical parameters that are of interest here. One of them is the mean uh, or the shock Mach number, so that's represented by M. And then the parameters characterizing the isotropic turbulence, so the Taylor microscale and the turbulence Mach number. So you can see here on the bottom, there is a representation of the different scales that are important in this flow. So you have the energy containing scales that's represented here by the integral length scale. Then you have the Kolmogorov scale representative of where most of the dissipation is going to uh, take place. Then there is the intermediate scale represented here by this lambda. This is a mathematically defined uh, length scale, the Taylor micro scale. And then much lower than the dissipation scales, we have the, the mean free path, which is characteristic of the thickness. Now, in the case of mixing, on top of this, you have um, another parameter that we're going to inter introduce in a moment. But before we move to the mixing, I just wanted to tell you that there is extensive work that has been done in previous studies. And um, I mentioned some of them in the previous slide. There is also the additional work on the large eddy simulations by uh, Dr. Lewis group. And um, I want to mention that in those studies, it's been confirmed that the turbulence kinetic energy is amplified. So this is the effect of the shock on the turbulence itself. It reaches saturation. So this is in agreement with uh, linear interaction analysis theory. After you increase the Mach number at uh, probably about three or a little bit beyond, you are going to reach saturation of this amplification of turbulence kinetic energy. So this is here on the left, the effect on the turbulence by the shock. On the right, what you see is the effect on the shock by the turbulence. So initially the shock is nominally planar, but then because of the passing of the turbulence, it's going to get corrugated. The corrugation is going to be increased as you increase the turbulence number of the incoming turbulence, and you can obtain uh, regions of the shock that are actually vanishing. So that's what is called the shock holes. So basically the topology of the shock may change when you have sufficiently strong um, turbulence coming in. So this is a very well studied problem. Uh, the canonical configuration, both in the DNS, shock capturing DNS, and to some extent, LES. Now, we wanted to look at the mixing. So when you include a passive scalar mixing into the picture, what's going to, uh, to happen? And then we have to bring an additional parameter, which is the Schmidt number, and that uh, you can think of the passive scalar as a colorant or a dye in, in, in the gas that we have and it has no dynamical effect on the flow. It's simply transported, so advected and diffused by the background flow. And we basically have a number of these uh, transport equations to be added to the Navier-Stokes equations. So here D 
represents the diffusivity and phi sub m is the passive scalar m for the different indexes that we, we use. And um, the problem that we are going to study first. As opposed to the canonical uh, flow dynamics of the shock turbulence interaction, as I showed you before, there is extensive work, prior work on it. The mixing has been less studied compared to that uh, hydrodynamics. There is a few studies coming from Tian and collaborators in 2017 and 2018. And those are on the variable density effects on multi-fluid mixing. And then there is a recent study by Bukharfani in 2018 and they were looking at the effect of uh, the Mach number for relatively low Mach numbers, turbulence Mach numbers, and Reynolds numbers based on the Taylor microscale. So in the present study that uh, we were carrying on, we wanted to look at the effects of this Ari lambda, M, MT, and to some extent, the Schmidt number on the passive scalar mixing, extending what has been looked at before. So this is the number of cases that we were Considering, as you can see here on this uh, map on the bottom right, we looked at uh, Mach numbers going from 1.28 all the way to 5. So, some going beyond the saturation point for the turbulence kinetic energy amplification. And we also looked at the turbulence Mach number going from 0.1 all the way to 0.4. And then, for three cases, we looked at uh, different Reynolds numbers. So, Ari lambda of 40 and Ari lambda of 70 which in the case of shock uh, capturing DNS, this is about the state of the art nowadays. In LES, the work that I was mentioning before by pulling and collaborators, they have reached much higher Ari lambdas. Just a note about the turbulence Mach number, even though the value is relatively small compared to one, uh, values of MT beyond 0.3 can lead to the presence of shocklets, so the flow may become locally supersonic. This MT is based on the RMS velocity, so you may have much higher local values of the, of the Mach number. Okay, so this is the, the setup of simulations that we're going to consider. In terms of the Schmidt number, we were looking at the 0.5, 1, and 2, but uh, we did see significant differences within this small range of Schmidt numbers. So I'm just going to focus on simulations with a Schmidt number of one. So I'm going to tell you now the computation setup. So you have this STI simulation, shock turbulence interaction simulation. We make the shock statistically stationary to be at the same location, even though it has intrinsic unsteadiness, but we fix the location by setting the back pressure to the right value. In the computational domain, we are going to include also a sponge layer that is going to damp the acoustic reflections coming from the outlet so that they don't have a significant effect on the subsonic part of the, of the flow. And then I forgot to mention that as you can see on this table, we include uh, shock regimes both in the wrinkle and the broken shock state. So most of them are in the wrinkle regime, uh, three of them are in the broken regime. So the grid is going to be stretching X, uh, uniform in Y and Z, where we have periodicity. So we have periodic boundary conditions in those transverse directions. And then these are some details about the numerical schemes that we use. So this is a high order code initially developed by uh, Professor Johan Larsson, now at the University of Maryland. And we made extensions to account for passive scalar mixing. But the numerical schemes are the same as in the original code. In particular, we are using six order center schemes away from the shocks and fifth order we know near the shock. So this is a solution adaptive hybrid method. And then to switch between one scheme or the other, we are using a shock sensor that is based on local dilatation and entropy, similar to a Ducro type of sensor. And then we have a fourth order standard RK for time integration. I mentioned already the periodic boundary conditions in the transverse directions, and then we have the outlet pressure that sets the shock to be statistically stationary. Now, you have to feed turbulence to this STI simulation. To do that, we run precursor simulations of uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence that then we blend together following the same approach as in lab, uh, previous work. Uh, 
and then we apply rotations to statistically decorrelate the different uh, blended boxes of homogeneous isotropic turbulence. All right, so I'm going to start showing you some results just uh, as a verification step. This is something that is already known about the shock turbulence interaction, as I mentioned before, but this is for the simulations that we've been running. So what you see here is as a function of the stream bus location here in the horizontal axis, we are choosing zero to be the, the mean uh, shock location. And then we have this grayed out regions corresponding to the unsteady shock. And then the different colors correspond to uh, different cases. I'm going to show you the label in a moment. But what you can see is that as we increase the Mach number, there is uh, an increase in the amplification of turbulence that takes place downstream, downstream of the shock. You can also observe that um, the unsteady shock region is going to be of different thickness for different cases. So for different Mach numbers and different empty values, you're going to obtain a different unsteady shock region. Subsequent plots, I'm going to collapse this region so that it's not interfering with the with the analysis, but we have to keep in mind that it's changing from case to case. Now on the left is the turbulence, actually the, the streamwise rain stress normalized by the upstream uh, counterpart, upstream of the shock. And then on the right, you see the passive scalar fluctuation. So there is no jump of this quantity. There is no jump condition across the shock. So that's reflected in this statistical analysis but you can see that there is a change of slope. This change of slope is not only coming because of the change of the velocity, upstream and downstream of the shock, but it is also a consequence of the change in the dissipation rate of, uh, of the passive scalar. All right, and just to mention that these quantities are Fabre average quantities. All right, so some of the statistical analysis that we were carrying over uh, were accounting for this uh, scalar variance transport, and then I'm going to show you the scalar dissipation rate transport. If you decompose those uh, equations into these multiple terms, we have six terms basically mathematically that you can obtain. Two of them are going to be negligible, so I'm going to uh, neglect them for now. And then you're left with the dilatational term, the turbulent diffusion term, and the turbulent dissipation rate. And this is the, the results that you would obtain, actually the ones that we obtain in our simulations for the different uh, cases of application. What you can see is that the dilatational term, as you increase the Mach number of the shock, it's going to eventually saturate. So blue in all these figures that I'm going to show you corresponds to a value of the Mach number of three. If you keep increasing all the way to five, what you can see is that the amplification of this dilatational term is not going to increase beyond that Mach number of three. So the red line is below the blue line here. The turbulent diffusion follows a similar pattern. You don't see much amplification beyond uh, Mach number of three. This one is a bit more difficult to, to obtain um, average statistics that are not uh, fluctuating like you see here. So that's the trickiest among the three quantities. And then on the right, you have the turbulent uh, dissipation rate. Here it's a scale by the density multiplied by the diffusivity of the passive scalar. But you, what you can see is that as you increase the Mach number, this quantity does not saturate. So you increase the Mach number, the dissipation rate is going to keep increasing, at least in the range that we have considered all the way to Mach number of five. And then the dashed lines here correspond to the cases with the higher Reynolds number, Taylor microscale Reynolds number. And you can see that the effect is a little bit less significant compared to the Mach number for the range again that we are considering. Now you may wonder why is that uh, scalar dissipation rate not saturating? So to have a better look at it, we are going to now plot the corresponding terms in the budget of scalar dissipation rate equation. Now you can decompose that equation, the terms that you have here on the right hand side in multiple different ways. We are choosing this approach. We just have three terms, G, H and J. Now G again is going to be uh, negligible in this configuration 
STI canonical configuration. So you're just left with a balance between the three terms that we have now on the screen. Convection on the left and then the two terms on the right hand side. Term H corresponds to the interaction between the velocity gradient and the scalar gradient. Basically you have here the product of the scalar gradient dot product the velocity gradient dot product the scalar gradient again. And this is going to be related to alignments of the scalar gradient and the strain rate tensor eigenvectors. So we're going to talk a little bit in more detail about these alignments in a moment, but for now let's continue with the statistical analysis in the volumetric sense. So the term on the right is the molecular diffusion, again involving the diffusivity D of the passive scalar. This is now the picture representing the evolution downstream as they cross a shock of each one of these two terms. We are scaling with the value of the molecular diffusion upstream of the shock as a reference for both terms. And what you can see is that um, they are comparable in the order of magnitude, even though the molecular diffusion is, is larger. And you can also see that, again, term H is going to saturate beyond Mach number of three. So again, the blue line corresponds to three. The red line is the highest Mach number that we have explored. And then in the dashed line, you have the effect of the Ari lambda, which is a little bit less than the effect that you can see for this range of Mach numbers. And then on the right, you have the molecular diffusion Again, this one doesn't saturate as you keep increasing the Mach number. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about this uh, relation to the alignments. So to introduce the alignments, I want to, to show this plot. Basically, you can decompose the strain rate tensor into a set of eigenvectors. So those are going to be alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is going to be the most extensive so that's going to be order to be the most positive. Then we have the beta intermediate eigenvalue, and then the most compressive is going to be gamma. So we have this relation between the corresponding eigenvalues here. And then uh, I think the study of alignment started with Ashurst in the late uh, 1980s. And these alignments are important among other things in the representation of structure-based models of turbulence. For example, the, the stretch vortex, spiral vortex model by pulling. And uh, basically that term is going to enter this representation of H, the one that we introduced before and we had a look at the statistics. So we want to see if we can get some insight from looking at the alignments we introduced uh, during the CTR summit program in 2018, this uh, different approach to look at the alignments in what we call this barycentric map. So basically each one of these vertices represents the different eigenvectors, alpha, beta, and gamma. And then we can plot the distribution of alignments for all the points in a different plane at different streamwise locations of the flow. And that's going to tell us whether we have preferential alignment with uh, gamma, as in this case, that you can see the distribution is closer to the gamma vertex, or if we had preferential alignment with any, other, any of the other two eigenvectors. So what we're going to do in order to compare cases is to look at the signature of this distribution, and that's going to be represented here by the 80% contour line and the peak value given by the circle. And that's going to be enough to represent um, this distribution. And now we are going to be comparing the cases before the shock and after the shock for the different Mach numbers and Reynolds numbers. So for all the pre-shock state of all the cases, we have a similar distribution. So that's going to be the one that uh, you see here in green. And then I'm going to show you what happens with the alignment of the scalar gradient Navla phi, then the vorticity, which is going to be the central plot, and this is the streamwise direction. So in the pre-shock pre state, what we can see is that uh, the gradient of uh, the scalar is going to be mostly aligned with the most compressive eigenvector, gamma. And then secondly, with the most extensive eigenvector, alpha. And then for the vorticity, we actually have a very different picture. 
the vorticity, as it is well known in homogeneous isotropic turbulence, it is mainly aligned with the intermediate eigenvector beta. And then as we expect, this is just a verification, the streamwise direction has no preferential alignments. This is why uh, we have the central location here in the barycentric map, because in the pre-shock state, we have isotropic turbulence, so there should be no preferential alignment. Okay, so now what happens when we look at the post-shock state? So what we can see is that as we increase the Mach number, there is a transition. This is the inset representing the zoom of what you see below. So there is a transition going from preferential alignment with um, gamma, going towards equidistribution between gamma and alpha. And in any case, it's going farther away from the alignment with beta, with the intermediate eigenvector. For the vorticity, what we see is that we have increased even more the alignment with uh, the intermediate eigenvector, beta. And then, as opposed to the isotropic turbulence that we had before in the pre-shock state, we are going to get anisotropic turbulence. So that's the reason why we see this transition from the center location towards, again, pretty much an equidistribution between alignment with alpha and with gamma. So those are the conclusions that I was just telling you about in words. And then these conclusions are strengthened when you increase the Mach number, but also when you decrease the Ari lambda. So the, the plots get a bit busy. Basically the dashed lines correspond to the increased Ari lambda, but the bottom line is what you have here on the, on the, in the text on the bottom right. Now you can also look at uh, what happens to the scalar dissipation that is conditioned on the alignments. So these are the two plots that you have on the center and on the right. So in the pre-shock state, the scalar distribution is mainly concentrated in this part of the, of the domain of the barycentric map. In the post-shock state, however, you have a transition. Again, it is a bit clearer looking at the inset here. So you have a transition by which the scalar dissipation condition on the alignment is going to get closer to the values that you see for the preferential alignment of scalar gradient and the eigenvectors of the strain rate tensor. And this correlation is what may be uh, explaining in part the improved um, dissipation rate that we see, the improved mixing in the shock turbulence interaction. So this is a correlation between the peak locations and the distributions of scalar dissipation and those of preferential alignment of scalar gradient. All right, so that covers a little bit of the overview that I wanted to give you for the statistical analysis. I should mention that if you have interest in that part of the talk, uh, there is a, a GFM that was published earlier this year with Gao as the main author and then myself and, and Dr. L uh, Johan Larsson at the University of Maryland. So if you have interest, uh, that can be a good reference to, to look at. I want to touch a little bit now upon the structural tracking, still within the context of shock-induced mixing, but this is going to depart from the statistical volumetric analysis and move on to more looking at the structures that conform this flow. And uh, this is the work by Jonas Buchmeier. So to give you a qualitative qualitative representation of what we want to do. On the left, you have the slices of this flow. So flow coming from the left, you have the shock sitting somewhere here, and then you have the deceleration. This is the passive scalar represented from red to blue, from zero to one. And then what we are doing is take isocontours of this um, passive scalar in 3D, and then follow the evolution of these structures. So here I have isolated just two structures. On the top, you have the physical evolution as they move downstream. On the bottom, you, what you have is a graph representation of the interactions between this structure and others. For example, the second one that you see coming uh, from the left. And you can see a number of uh, events that take place in the evolution of this structure. So we want to, to be able to track this evolution, to track the events that take place, and to relate both the structures corresponding to different fields or possibly the same field, but also the geometry. So we want to do that in an automatic, automatic way. So briefly, 
I just want to highlight that the tracking methodology that we've been developing over the last few years falls into this hybrid category that includes attribute-based and region-based explicit extraction uh, type of uh, tracking. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, if you have interest, we can talk afterwards or in a follow-up discussion, but I'm just going to emphasize that we use a three-step approach. So, well, there is a pre-step that is going to extract the structures of interest. In our case, that's going to be isocontours, isosurfaces of the passive scalar field. And then we're going to apply this tracking in three steps. We're going to solve the correspondence problem, finding correspondences between two frames, two time steps of the tracking. Then we're going to apply a constraining process based on physical realizability. And then we're going to go to the second step, which is the formation of events. There is a subs subsequent uh, follow-up step or a stage in this second step, which is the constraining of events that have been formed based on correspondences, again, based on physical realizability. And finally, there is the formation of this dynamic graph, directed graph, that we can query then for analysis of the structure evolution. There is, uh, of course, many more details than what I'm just telling you in this overview. In particular, the, treat the treatment of periodic boundary conditions is going to be critical, but I'm not going to dive into it. Uh, our approach is not the only one. There are many approaches to tracking in the literature, and I have highlighted some of the early efforts in the context of fluid dynamics here. Tracking is also applied to many other fields of science, so the literature is quite vast, particularly in the computer graphics context. So just to give you briefly an overview of what we do with the geometric characterization, we take a structure, imagine that you have this uh, tube-like structure conforming a torus. We characterize it geometrically first at the local level, so we calculate the differential geometry properties, basically the principal curvatures, we translate those into what's known as the shape index and curveness, and then we integrate those into a joint PDF of shape index here in the horizontal axis and curveness in the vertical axis. The shape index is telling you about the type of point that you have. It can be a spherical cap, it can be a ridge, it can be a saddle, and that's going to translate into this numerical value going from zero to one. And then the dimensionless curveness is telling you basically about the relative radius of curvature that you have at any given point of the structure. So a value of zero corresponds to a flat, nearly flat surface locally. And then as you increase the dimensionless curveness, you go into higher and higher um, curvature, which means smaller radius of curvature. And then there is this global compactness or stretching, we called it in the past parameter. This is just a global property of the structure related to the volume and the area. But something to keep in mind is that all these properties that we eventually represent into this reduced signature space are dimensionless. And they correspond to so different locations in this uh, signature space or feature space correspond to different geometries. For example, blobs are going to live in the one, one, one region. And then tubes are going to live into this uh, axis. And then if you move towards lower values of the dimensionless curveness, you're going to look at more sheet-like geometries. So flatter ge geometries. So this is in a nutshell, the type of geometric characterization that we perform for all the Educe structures from the turbulent flow. And then this plot looks familiar because it's the same one that I was showing you before, but now what we do is to initialize the scalar field to a predetermined shape, in this case, spherical shape that we then transport, advect, and diffuse through the STI domain. So we're going to consider the initialization of these uh, spheres corresponding to different radius. So that's going to be the Taylor microscale, twice that scale, and four times that scale. And then we let it evolve, and we track these structures in time. So I'm going to highlight some of the results. This is just a qualitative uh, view of the tracking. Each color here corresponds to one structure. 
And then on the right, you're going to see the periodic reconnection that we carry on to keep track of these uh, structures that are intersecting the boundaries so that we can track them as just one instead of multiple pieces. So you can see for the different uh, initial sizes that the life of these structures is going to be, the lifetime of these structures is going to be different. And this is now represented on the bottom plot. This is the graph representation of the medium sphere um, structures that we have from the beginning corresponding to the top location here of the graph all the way to the end of their lifetime. So this is what we have in this graph. And then you can see it's a bit hard to see because there are many structures, but there is interactions taking place between them. So as time evolves, the, the graph is going to get more complex. If you look at the corresponding counterpart for the larger structures, something that you can see is that they live longer as expected because they take longer to completely diffuse. And the interactions that we see are also a bit more complex. So there is more connections between the different branches representing the life of each structure. So there is more interactions. So this is more a qualitative representation for the time being. I just want to finalize the qualitative representation by looking at the STI simulation before I was showing you the homogeneous isotropic turbulence. This is now the shock turbulence interaction. And in this case, what you can see is that the complexity of the interactions downstream of the shock, which is represented here in this uh, transparent color, is going to increase. That complexity of the events that you get is going to increase. So here I'm showing you compound events, including splits and merges of different order. And we are able to capture those correctly with the tracking. So there is a lot of verification work that goes into this development of the tracking methodology. Now we can get statistics telling us, for instance, about the number of um, different events. So continuation, events that the structure is not changing through interaction with others, but also a split events, merge events, and so on. And we can evaluate the effect of the shock compared to the homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So for example, in this plot, you have the, the normalized number of events that you can get creation and disappearances after you cross the shock, which is represented here by zero. And the same for a split and merge events corresponding to the homogeneous isotropic turbulence. That's the solid line. Sorry, that's the dashed line. And then shock turbulence interaction corresponding to the solid line. And this is for the three different sizes that we have evaluated. So spheres with the tail microscale uh, for radius and then two times the Taylor micro scale and four times. And then what we wanted to do is to relate uh, physics and geometry of the structures. This is a qualitative representation of one of these structures evolving in time. And then you have the curveness, dimensionless curveness mapped on it. So you can see that red regions here correspond to high curveness and there is a correlation between that high curveness and some physical quantities. For example, the alignment between the scalar gradient and the gamma eigenvector of the strain rate tensor. These correlations that you can see qualitatively here on this central picture, you can also quantify through a statistical analysis. And this is what I'm showing here on the right. So this is the alignment between the scalar gradient and the different eigenvectors of the strain rate tensor, but now condition on the geometry. So condition on the dimensionless curveness that we have over the ensemble of structures. And you can see that from the pre-shock to the post-shock and downstream states, you start to see correlations, as I was mentioning bef before, between the curveness, low curveness values, correlating flatter regions will correlate with uh, better alignment between the most compressive eigenvector, gamma, and the scalar gradient. So these red regions here correspond to flatter regions on the left, corresponding to blue. And that correlation is now manifested here in these statistics. And you can do the same for other physical quantities, such as the scalar gradient itself. This is an indication of where the dissipation is going to take place. So this is telling us that it takes place 
uh, through this quantification in regions that are relatively flatter of the structures. And the same for the other quantities, you could include here others such as the vorticity and so on. Finally, we also look at trajectories in this geometric space of parameters. So starting from the spherical shape at the initial time for all these initial structures, you can see how they evolve in the geometric feature space. So they follow for the largest spheres, they follow this trajectory, increasing the curveness, moving up, decreasing this compactness parameter, and eventually you're going to start having significant split events that break the structures apart, and they bring the compactness to higher levels here, closer to one, with relatively no change in the global curveness. This on the right is the representation of the evolution of those trajectories in the shape index, in the horizontal direction, curveness plane. And here you have kind of the helper to, to tell you what these different co coordinates represent. So again, this is just to give you kind of an overview of the type of analysis combining geometry and physics that this tracking approach, this tracking methodology enables us to do. And then this is the corresponding counterpart for the STI. So the trajectories are going to be affected by the crossing of the shock. And this is what you can see actually here in this linear part of the trajectory. And um, that's what I wanted to cover in terms of the shock induced mixing. As I mentioned before, I'm going to skip through the shock induced ignition in the interest of time. So I'm going to jump to the flow structure interaction so that I can talk a little bit about the work of uh, Jonathan Hoy, who is the third student whose work I, I am presenting in this, in this seminar. So he's been working over the last few years on coupling different solvers, a flow solver, finite volume, a finite element solid mechanics solver, and then mesh deformation module to look at the problem of shock turbulent band related interaction with a flexible panel. This is the configuration that we are looking at. You have a compression wedge that is generating an incident shock that shock is going to impinge on the incoming turbulent boundary layer. And that turbulent boundary layer is developing over this flexible panel. If the shock wave is strong enough, it's going to produce this separation bubble. And that separation bubble has dynamics that introduce low frequency motions for the separation bubble. So you're going to have breathing motions that are happening at lower frequency compared to the incoming turbulent boundary layer frequencies. But also the shock system is going to move at those low frequencies. And as you can imagine, if these frequencies resonate with the natural frequencies of the panel, eventually that can lead to a catastrophic behavior, catastrophic failure of the structure. And if this is happening during flight, for example, in an engine or in a control surface for aerodynamics, that's going to be problematic. So we wanted to look at this problem again in a canonical configuration in addition to the shock system, you're going to get, because of this compression wedge, a prandtl made expansion behind. And that's going to affect the incident and reflected shocks as well. All right, so we are following the experiments that were carried in uh, Germany by Willems, Daub, and collaborators. I have to mention that there is one simulation of this FSI setting and then there is uh, flow simulations of the rigid case by Pasquarello and collaborators from 2015 and 2017. Those were well-resolved LES. We want to use a wall model LES approach that is going to reduce the cost and uh, hopefully allow us to calculate the, to, to run the simulation for much longer times to look at these low frequency motions. So just a few comments about the numerical approach. We use a loosely coupled partition between this flow solver and the solid solver. We have body fitted non conformal and unstructured meshes, both for the flow solver and for the solid solver. And then we have a third module, which is given here in green. That's going to be critical to transfer the deformation of the solid solver into the flow solver domain. We don't apply
the mesh information module everywhere in the flow. We just apply it in the region of interest that is going to be mostly affected by the flexibility of the panel. These are some details about the meshes that we are using and the coupling between the time stepping of the different solvers. The coupling is not the same between the flow and the solid and vice versa. So we transfer the data from the flow to the solid much quicker, much more frequently than from the solid to the flow. And that has to do with the different frequencies that are um, significant in the evolution of the flow and of the solid itself. We are going to apply spanwise periodicity as in previous studies, but now we are moving from these spanwise periodic simulations to full span in upcoming simulations. This is giving you a qualitative description of the flow. I'm going to skip through some of the early development. What you can see is that the shock is being generated. It's showing up here and then it's going to propagate upstream. So here you see it propagating relatively slowly. This is of course um, slowed down. This is about 11 milliseconds into the simulation and and then you could you could see the separation bubble forming and the panel deforming also. The panel deformation is given here by the gray scale. And what you see on the slice is the streamwise velocity. So blue regions correspond to the separation bubble here. Instantaneous separation. So let me move on. This is some verification on the incoming turbulent boundary layer. We have relatively good agreement on the Van der transform velocity. The gray region here correspond, corresponds to the wall model region and everything else is coming from the LES itself. The agreement with the reference data on the Reynolds stresses is not as good so far, but uh, just want to point out that this is work in progress. It is not published yet. So uh, please take everything with a little bit of, uh, of caution. This is now the response of the flexible panel. On the horizontal axis, you have the spatial location. And then on the vertical axis, we, we have the time evolution. And you can see that um, it's quite complex. I should mention that this is a nonlinear, geometrically nonlinear solid mechanics solver. And you can see that uh, in the experiment, they had three probes, the front, the center, and the rear probe. And I'm going to show you now comparison between the simulations and the experimental results or measurements for these three probes. And this is the slide. So what you can see here, the solid line corresponds to the present simulations. The dashed line corresponds to the experiments by Davon collaborators. And this dotted line corresponds to the center probe that was present in the FSI simulation by Pasquarello. So that can be considered the state of the art at the moment. As you can see on the center line, we have a relatively good agreement. It's not perfect by any means, but it's relatively good agreement compared for instance with Pasquarello and collaborators. Now on the front and rear, what we have is in the transient region, the agreement is not ideal, but then as you move to later times, the static deflection is going to agree pretty well, and the frequencies are not actually too off from the experimental values. So I'm actually pretty happy with this agreement at the moment. Considering that there is many unknowns, for example, the damping coefficients in the experiments are not known, so we have to infer them from, from some of the analysis of the data that they show. And then we can start looking, I'm going to conclude uh, quickly so that we can have uh, the session for questions, but we can start looking at the differences between rigid panel and flexible panel. This is the wall pressure as a function of time in a color map as a function of time and space. And you can start to see these frequency, low frequency motions coming from the interaction with the panel as well as from the separation bubble. You can also see the effect on the wall pressure profile over time, comparing the rigid case with the flexible case. So the flexibility is going to lead to a decrease wall pressure footprint compared to the rigid configuration. And then looking at the uh, power spectral density of the wall pressure, again, you can see differences between the rigid case. This is the location of the compression wave, compression shock 
and this is representative of these low frequency motions that are present when the separation bubble exists, when the interaction is strong enough. And you can see that flexibility is bringing those values a little bit lower in frequency and also making this region a bit wider in space, which is represented here by the horizontal location. The vertical location corresponds to the frequency or the Struhal number. The horizontal location corresponds to the, to the space coordinate. All right, so uh, let's conclude here. I'm going to leave the conclusions up on the screen in case you have um, you have questions so that at least we have five minutes uh, for questions. So once again, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to, to take any questions. Um, thank you so much for that excellent talk. Those simulations are just beautiful, like oh, amazing movies. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, so we have time for a few questions. Um, if you are in the audience and you want to ask a question, feel free to unmute your mic and ask it, or you can put your hand up in the participant list and I can kind of call on you to, to ask a question or you can type it into the chat as well. So maybe um, just to get the ball, roll, ball rolling, um, I was wondering, just in one of those last few slides, you showed your um, wall model LES compared to it was the wall resolved LES and your, yours seemed to be doing better than the, the past one just compared to the experiment. So this is comparing like the black dotted line to yeah, yeah. Do, you have, so, do you have kind of any insight into why yours with the wall model is kind of doing better? Than yeah, that's a great point. Um, what I should mention here, I was talking a little bit uh, maybe too quickly about the damping coefficient. In the simulation by Pasquarello, they didn't include any damping and that's why you don't see any uh, re reduction in this, in this amplitude. Actually, it seems that it's increasing a bit. So in our case, we include a finite element solver for the solid mechanics, which is different from what they were using. And we introduce damping in the simulation. And that's why we see this um, reduction in the amplitude of the oscillations. Again, this is not the parameter that we have from the experiments, but we infer that. And then we did some, some verification studies to make sure that we are getting at least qualitatively the right uh, damping coefficient. We are running now more simulations that I didn't present uh, today, trying to calibrate, if you will, this damping coefficient. The idea is now, if we calibrate with one simulation, can we use it for prediction of different conditions? So this is for a Mach number of three, a compression wedge angle of 17.5 uh, degrees in the final configuration. But uh, Daub and collaborators, they run experiments with multiple conditions. So Mach 4, Alpha, going from 12 all the way to 20. So we want to use now these values that we have found for the damping coefficient and so on, and use them in predictive simulations so that uh, we can compare later blindly with the experiments. But I think the discrepancy here in Pasquarello and collaborators, going back to your question, stems from the lack of damping and probably the solid mechanics solver that they used, which is quite different from the finite element method that we use. Well, thank you, that answered my question. And I look forward to, to seeing your new simulations. Exciting. Nice. Um, do you have any questions from the audience? Oh, Sharam, are you, we can't hear you. I guess it should be, yes. I just have one question about your first part, turbulent mixing in passive scale. You are trying to go for real application, right? Going for jet simulations and then hydrogen might be more relevant in that sense. Hmm. How, what's the difficulty of going for uh, a Smith number near to hydrogen. You pick one in your simulations. Is there any difficulty to going for uh, something relatively close to what is actually in the real engine happening? Or yeah, that's a great point. 
In terms of the passive scalar mixing simulations, the higher the Schmidt number, the, the more difficult it's going to be because you need to resolve finite scales of the passive scalar. So we are using the same uh, grid for the, for the flow dynamics, for the hydrodynamics, and for the passive scalar. So in principle, we cannot go to very high Schmidt numbers if we want to preserve the Reynolds number. What we did actually in the work that I was not presenting is to use um, the same solver, but in 2D for studies of shock induced ignition. We have applied it to 3D, but the computational time is just uh, prohibitive at the moment. So in that case, we are using actually hydrogen combustion. We tried also with uh, JP7, uh, but um, we get a bit closer to those physical conditions that you are describing, which eventually are the ones that we want to target. But I should mention that the canonical STI configuration studies that we did are more meant as a physical insight to provide physical insight and understanding more than applicability, direct applicability to a um, scramjet engine, which is more the end goal. And I think there is a comment in the chat. It says, how does the PSD of the wall pressure spectra of the low frequency and steadiness compares to the natural frequency of the panel? And that's a great question. I didn't include here the plots, but uh, these frequencies at the moment are a bit higher. So that's why we cannot see them. Actually, the low frequency motions of the panel are not visible here. In addition to this work, which is comparing to the experiments, uh, we were also carrying other simulations, changing the thickness of this panel so that eventually we can see the low frequencies interacting with the resonant frequencies or natural frequencies of the panel. So eventually you're going to see them show up here. Hopefully if you can see my cursor, eventually you're going to sh see them show up a little bit below these uh, low frequency motions that we see in this picture. So that was initially the motivation behind this work. If those natural frequencies of the panel resonate, we expect to see them appear in this PSD of the wall pressure as well. Okay, uh, any other questions before we finish up? Okay. Well, if that's the case, uh, we'll thank our speaker again. Thank you, Ivan, uh, for your talk. And uh, finish up there, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next week. Mm -hmm.